what happens between 800 and 1,000? A lot of things. And the most important thing is that between 800 and 1,000, Europe continuously progresses toward uh, a great sort of summit of recovery at the year 1,000. Part of it is psychological. The year 1000 was scaring people. People in 998 and 999, they were scared to death. They were afraid their computers might blank out, you know, when it went to 1000, uh, because they weren't sure their computers could handle that fourth digit. Uh, but fortunately, it could. And so everything went OK with the computers in 999. But the other thing they were afraid of is they thought maybe the world was coming to an end at the year 1000. As Christians, they knew that the Bible predicted things would end. And so a lot of people were thinking, well, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great? I mean, wouldn't that be the right year to have it all end at the year 1000? You know, it started at zero, now it's 1000. So in 999, everybody in Europe started getting nervous. And they lived nervous for a whole year, all of 999, because they were sure on December 31st, Everything would stop, be all over. God would come there on the first day of January and judge everybody and send most of them to hell, of course, because they all knew they were sinners. And then just a few might get to go to heaven. So everybody was very frightened of the year 1000. Then the year 1000 came on, you know, December 31st, 999. Everybody went into Times Square and, you know, celebrated and everything. And on January 1st, everybody was still there. So on January, they started to worry that they'd misunderstood and that the last judgment would come on December 31st, 1000. So now they had to live the whole year from January to December worrying, you see, worrying that it would all happen on January 1st, 1001. Well, when they got to 1001 and nothing bad happened, everybody breathed a sigh of relief and said, well, we must have got it wrong. We must have got it wrong. And therefore, good news, we get another 1,000 years. It's going to happen in 2000. There was a a sigh of relief, there was a positive attitude, there was a positive build things, expand things, let's go to work here, and, and it was a tremendous spurt of creativity, and this map on the screen tells you that around the year 1000, the Italian city-states especially uh, managed to create uh, a peaceful Mediterranean, so they're able to tame uh, the Islamic navies that have been attacking them. And there's a zone of peace created around Italy, then further to the east and further to the west. All of a sudden, 10, 10, 10, 20, 10, 30, Europe expands their commerce and their travel and their navigation and their products. And from then on, from 1,000 on, it's explosive. It's just explosive growth. And one of the things that happens, you see it right on the map, look at the blue trade routes. The key thing that happens in 10, 20, 30, 40 is that these Italian city-states around the coast of Italy, Genoa, Venice, Amalfi, Ancona, Bar, all these coastal cities, Pisa, they manage to send their ships to the Black Sea and pick up products, bring them to Italy, and then load them off of the ships and over the Alps, over the mountains. And with that movement, these city-states, Venice, Genoa, and others, become enormously rich, enormously prosperous, because they just simply can't, they just can't supply enough product. The North wants everything that they can bring in, and the Far East wants everything they can bring back. They're bringing back fur and lumber and all sorts of products that they can get from the North, uh, fish, salted fish, all sorts of things, and the products they can get from the East, from India, are exactly the things that the rest of Europe wants. So suddenly, city-states like Venice and Genoa become enormously prosperous, simply packed into their ships all the goodies that they have, and then they offload and take them over the Alps to the north. So those blue routes that you see on the screen, those are the magic of the year 1000. Now, nobody yet will take a ship all the way out into the Atlantic and up the West Coast. So those uh, red and yellow lines are for later. So it'll be really 300 years before the European shippers from Genoa and Venice go all the way up the West Coast. The actual date of the first Flanders fleet, which was the name given to the huge ships that were leaving Venice uh, and going all the way to the Netherlands and back, those first went in 1317. So that's the time of Dante, 1317. So that's still 300 years. But in 1000, nobody's afraid to go over the Alps and over the passes and up the Brenner Pass and over the mountains and into Bavaria and southern France. So 
this is the breakthrough. Uh, not just for Italy, not just for Venice, not just for Genoa, but for all of Europe. And so with this expansion of trade, you get population growth, you get agricultural growth. People cultivate more land because they can sell the extra that they're growing now. They have markets. They can go to market. This is the farmer can come from the uh, agricultural part of Tuscany. He can go down to Florence. He can sell his product. The Florentine merchant who's running the market or in the market, he takes his excess and he goes to Pisa, puts it on the ship, and that extra is taken to France or to someplace else. So the whole, the, the population grew, the uh, protein they were eating grew, the amount of food that people could have the surplus that they had, they could now sell for money. So money begins to circulate in the, uh, in the economy. And so this is, this is now the beginning of the road to, uh, to early modernity. And all of that brings us back to France, okay? This all comes back to France now for Eleanor of Aquitaine. And I've just taken you through 500 years of history. Are you exhausted? We have France in front of us, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. And what we want to say, a couple of things about France itself. We're interested in that southwest corner. Uh, there's something unusual about that southwest corner. The thing you've already discovered is, one of the unusual things, is it's connected through to Islamic Spain. So this southwest corner of France is very progressive in that it is encountering this other world, this Islamic world, which is the most different world that anybody knows on the planet from Europe. And that different world is full of provocative things to read and discuss, including religion. So in this era now, from 1000 to, say, 1122, books will come into Europe from Islamic Spain. Frenchmen will study things from Islamic Spain. For instance, the man who's pope in the year 1000 has studied Islamic books. He has studied Arabic mathematics and other subjects that are coming in to France from east, south, northeastern Spain. So when he goes to Rome in the year 1000, he already knows about what is happening in Spain and therefore he's more sophisticated than many people around him. So that's just a little example of how that southwest corner of France is different than the rest of Europe. There's lots of other things too, but just to get started here and to talk about it, uh, there it is. So, so what we care about here on the screen is that southwest corner right up to the Pyrenees and the most important geographical uh, thing to take notice of is the river, the great huge river system that's cutting through that part of France, which gives it its name, Aquitaine, which means what? Waterland. Waterland, you know, it's like a ride, huh? Water, going to Waterland, right? And you get in the bath and you go around from Waterland. Well, it's like a big, big, big ride, except it's always been there. Uh, and, and the main ride is the ride down the Garonne, G-A-R-O-N-N-E. -N -N -E, and you see it right there on the map going to uh, Bordeaux. Let's go to a, a better map there, there. See the river? See the river going down through? That river starts in the Pyrenees. So it's one of the great rivers of Europe. And that river starts in the Pyrenees and goes all the way down from the great way up in like 10,000 foot high peaks down to Toulouse. And Toulouse is a river city, sits right on the river. And then it keeps going down uh, northwest, down, 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 until it floods into that whole huge floodplain around the city Bordeaux. So here's the River Garonne coming from the icy peaks of the Pyrenees. And uh, if we watch it drop down from the high, high mountains, there it is flooding out around. And all of that territory that you see around the river is very, very rich alluvial plain. It's wonderful soil. It's been getting all this river deposits for millions of years, and so now it is so rich that anything you stick in the ground grows like crazy. Uh, but the best thing to stick in the ground around this neighborhood are vines. And here's a map of vines. Th that map shows you all the different 
famous neighborhoods of the Garonne, areas of wine growing, both north of the river, south of the river. These have been cultivated for 2,000 years. These have been planted since Roman times and were already 1,000 years old when uh, Eleanor was the Duchess of Aquitaine. So this is one of the oldest wine growing regions on the planet and it has been cultivated without interruption since before the Romans. Even, even the residents here before the Romans knew what a great wine growing region this was. Here's a picture of the higher hills which are at great uh, elevation for the vines. So you see the vines right in front of us. And then further down, it gets a little lower. They still can grow fine, but, but this is the perfect. So these are the Grand Cru, the very, very greatest of the very greatest. Uh, and here, if we just turn around and look up to the hills, this is saint Emilion. So if you've ever been in any wine store and checked the prices and you were getting up to the hundreds of dollars for a bottle, probably, you know, you fainted when you got to that price. But it's probably from saint Emilion. So that's, that's a little town right behind the vines. You're looking through the fields of the vines. Um, and here's just one of these grand old vines that's been growing here for ages and ages and ages. Uh, and um, here's just one name of one vineyard that's been there for 2,000 years. This is Osson. This is, you can still buy wine from Osson. It's one of the greatest vineyards in the whole of the Bordeaux region. And it goes back to Roman times. Uh, it had a famous Roman villa here and its name comes from that villa, and that villa was owned by an Im important Roman official who became really chancellor to the emperor in, in Rome. Um, so, so this is just one example of the continuity. Uh, that's another view of saint Emilion. All of these areas are part of uh, Eleanor's uh, region. Okay, so there's our map up again. Uh, Bordeaux, as you can see on the map, is the capital. So Bordeaux is the capital of Aquitaine. Uh, it has always been the great city. It is like some of the other riverside cities that are exactly like it, that is, up the river a little bit. Uh, you want to have ocean-going ships able to come into port, but you don't want the bad people and the bad ships to come up uh, you know, you don't want to be right at the, at, the, uh, at the mouth because then they can come and invade your city. So the safer place is a little bit upstream. Often you can even put a chain, chain uh, thing across the, uh, uh, the river. So there are a number of, ri of river cities like this in Europe. Another one is Sevilla, which is just around the corner in Spain, exactly like Bordeaux. It's a river that feeds out into the west, and then the city is just up the river a bit, to, which makes it safe. Um, London is like this. London is exactly the same. City on the river, but not at the ocean, but up upstream a bit, which gives you more defense and more ability to defend it. Uh, above Bordeaux, another French city on the Loire va Valley River is Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S, and Nantes is exactly like this. On the Loire River, ocean-going ships can come to it, but up, up the river a bit. Okay, so Bordeaux. Bordeaux is the capital of Aquitaine and therefore the great city of, of Eleanor and her family. Here's a picture of uh, the great clock tower that is part of the walls, the ancient walls of the city. Uh, Bordeaux, of course, has sections that are 2,000 years old. There are things in Bordeaux that go back to the Romans. So this was a very important Roman city. The Romans recognized like everybody before and ever since that this, was a f that this was a very strategic place to have a city. It gave you control of the river. It gave you access to the ocean. It allowed your products to come in and out up and down the river. Uh, and so uh, it has been a city. The core of Bordeaux is a Roman grid. So the core of old Bordeaux inside this uh, clock tower is old Roman Bordeaux, and it's an exact perfect grid, a perfect square grid. Uh, so uh, this is her city. This is where she's from. This is where her family was from. Who were his, her family? Were her, her family, her antecedents, her father, her grandfather, great-grandfather, were the Dukes of Aquitaine. And the Dukes of Aquitaine were a very good example of how when Rome fell, 
And when the Roman structure of Europe disintegrated, in many different localities, there were Roman cities and Roman capitals still there, and locals uh, took over and built uh, uh, you know, uh, homes and villas, etc., and organized the locals and then became themselves leaders. And pretty soon, a new smaller state, not the empire, but a smaller state, a local state, was built around, in this case, Bordeaux. So the Dukes of Aquitaine are like uh, the Franks and like the Anglos and the Saxons and the King of Northumbria up in the north of England and all around Europe, in all these different places, some local force moves in to the debris after Rome falls and organizes a new state. And in this case, it was uh, Aquitaine and the Dukes of Aquitaine. And they arrive almost simultaneous with the decay of the Roman Empire. There's one of the, one of the unique things about Southwest France and this place and Eleanor and her family was that the distance between Rome and her family is tiny. That is temporal distance. This is one of those places in Europe where the locals are able to organize uh, very quickly and so there's the least amount of destruction, the least amount of uh, unity lost, the least amount of order lost, and the Dukes of Aquitaine come very quickly on the heels of the, of the Roman collapse. So that was good, and that meant that her family is ancient. Uh, the Dukes go back into the Dark Ages and are already organizing this part of France. And by her time, by the 1100s, uh, her father is one of the greatest leaders in Europe. Her grandfather and great-grandfather are recognized all over Europe as one of the preeminent uh, leaders, along with the Duke of Anjou, the Duke of Normandy, um, the, the, the Dukes of, uh, of the various Italian Dukes, all of, the, all of the great Dukes. So there is her world, and so it's here that she is born in 1122. 